Yeah. Now, because you, you did bring up Kyrie, I know you, you know you you've had a, a lot of conversations with Kyrie uh, as well in the past. He's also um, in Brooklyn with your guy KD, uh, who we got we got we got the, the the scoop KD story on on the, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, I got to get your take on the the coaching selection, and this 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 question is actually for Eric <laughs> as well. Um, how do you think that Steve Nash is going to do with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving? And if possibly, if they do somehow manage to bring in James Harden, how do you think that, that Steve Nash will, will fare running the show? You asking me or Eric? No, I'm asking you. I'm saying this is for Eric because we every time the, the Nets make a move, I, I like to give Eric his time because he he just destroys them. <laughs> so I want to give you a chance to to to, to give nah, me nah, hold on, hold on, hold on. To be fair, hold on. I don't destroy them. <laughs> I I just think that a, a lot of these moves are very iffy. But Scoob, I'm a, I'm I want you to go first on it. You know, I, I want to hear what you have to say about that about the question. So your question is about Nash and yes. how, he, how he'll the coach. I think when you look at I think one of the things that um, is going to help um, Nash um, is the fact that he's got his voice. You know, like, you know, if you go in a foxhole, you want people that you're familiar with. Uh, to, um, you want people who you're familiar with to have your back. And um, I think that you see that with uh, Amari Stoudemire. You see that with Mike D'Antoni. Um, and then, you know, on the Kevin Durant side, you see that with um, uh, who they brought in from uh, the Knicks, um, the assistant coach. Uh, da, 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 da. It, it crossed my. It, 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 no, uh, Royce. Uh, Roy Ivy. Roy Ivy. Roy Ivy. Roy Ivy. Yeah. yeah. Who's a good, who's a good friend of Kevin Durant? Off yet. Um, but yes, Royal Ivy. I think you see that. You know, Royal Ivy and, and, and Kevin are, are very close. Uh, Kevin is Kevin is the godfather of um, Royal's da daughter. And so, you know, when you look at that situation there, um, and then you bring back Jacques Vaughn. So I, I, I think, you know, who, who was the interim head coach and, you know, Kitty Atkinson was fired. So, you know, I, I look at that situation with Brooklyn. I think there's a lot of familiar faces and pieces. I think, you know, for Nash, it's going to be a comfortable situation. But I also think that hiring of Nash didn't really have a lot to do with race, like everybody said. I think it had to do with relationships. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that I've been around the league for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm old and young enough to remember sitting in a, in a, a, a visitor's locker room at the Meadowlands in New Jersey uh, with with – Jason Kidd, Kevin Johnson, Steve Nash, Danny Manning, Rex Chapman, and Sean Marks. Those guys were Phoenix Suns teammates back then. Mm -hmm. And so relationship basketball is a relationship business. And, um, you know, I think Nash was hired based upon um, his, his, his experience and the fact that he has a relationship with Kevin, be dating back to being a consultant with the Golden State Warriors. And also, you know, um, Kyrie Irving has played in uh, Steve Nash's kickball uh, game, uh, games that he would have in the summertime. I actually, you know, spent some time with Kai after playing that. And, um, you know, he, he's always marveled and spoken highly of uh, Nash. And uh, this was years ago. But to see that kind of, you know, that, that omen, if you will, to see him now as his head coach, I think it's a good situation. I also just think um, point guards uh, make good head coaches. You know, I, I reported recently that, you know, um, Rajon Rondo has the aspirations of you know, being an NBA head coach after he plays. And, you know, Houston is the perfect springboard for that. Or excuse me, Atlanta, Atlanta. is the ultimate springboard for that because um, he kind of replaces Vince Carter as a, as a veteran in residence and, in Atlanta, you know, and so except he still has a lot of le a lot left in the tank, and he's a point guard, and he'll come off the bench and mentor Trey Young, the same way that Sam Cassell did uh, for Rondo in Boston. And so when I look at there's all of those different pieces with Dash, I do think that point guards make better uh, head coach, make good head coaches. I won't say better, make good head coaches, because Paul Silas was a head coach or and was a center. Um, so you know when I when I look at um, just what Nash brings to the table. I think Nash has always just been somebody that's been respected. And, you know, we're just talking to different people around the league. 
Uh, I, I spoke to his agent uh, a few months ago. Uh, one of the things that you know he's talked to me about is how much Nash is so unselfish. Like he'll he'll want other people to to um, get certain deals and won't even take the percentage off of it because he just wants to see people win. And I, I it takes me back to that that old that old that saying. You know, the man who works so hard, works very hard will be paid as the person or man or woman will be paid as the person who works hard. So I think he's being rewarded by becoming the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. And, you know, I I think he has the support of his his players, the front office, and, you know, hopefully the fans buy in as well. Do you feel like um, Kyrie's comments um, put unnecessary pressure on Nash? You know, I know him and KD in the podcast, and he, he may have he may have just been speaking freely amongst his friend, and you know it it took on a life of his own where he makes a comment of you know we really don't need head, a head coach, and then Nash also being an inexperienced first time head coach with an assistant coach who has a lot of years under his belt. Do you feel those comments alone have have now created unnecessary pressure on Nash? I feel like I have be- as a member of the media, um, I have become the unofficial Kyrie interpreter. <laughs> Well, that's why I've got to ask you. The Kyrie whisper. I, I, yeah, I've got. That's why I've got to ask you. Listen, you know Kyrie much better than we know Kyrie, so I've got to come to you directly. I think that no, and and, and I said that for a reason because I think that when Kyrie speaks, you get mad, and then when he doesn't speak, you get mad too. Not you, people. They get mad, and I think that. I think. So I have. Um, I have friends having split time between Manhattan, Bronx, Jersey. There are, there are different, in my mind, there are different borough dialects. Um, And I feel like Brooklyn speaks differently than Bronx. Manhattan speaks differently than Staten Island. That's a fact. And I think, and I think sometimes, and Queen speaks their own language, but I think sometimes when somebody, family and friends that I have in the Bronx, I go there, I'll say, there goes that Bronx. And they'll be like, what are you talking about? I said, it's the tone that you don't hear. It's the tone that you don't, you don't, that you, that that's missing. And I, and I think sometimes with Kyrie, when he speaks, he doesn't always realize that the way he speaks, everybody else doesn't speak. And there's a tone that he assumes that people hear and, or he doesn't care. And I think, um, him being honorary Bronx by way of his father growing up in the Mitchell houses, maybe that's the Bronx I speak of. But I, I, I think when he says things to him, he, he means it from a good place, but everybody is going based off of the verbiage, not what's inferred. Yeah. And I think he's just in, a, in an interesting situation where when he speaks, um, people listen. When he doesn't speak, people listen to. And I think when, and I just think that that's just where it is. And again, that's why I think winning kind of, if winning can allow people, certain people to forget about Tom Brady's deflate gate blunder, Kyrie, who from all accounts has followed the rules, winning a championship for Brooklyn will pe- make people forget in the same vein too. Do, do, do you think, uh, if they stay healthy, the Nets make it to the NBA Finals. I think they have the opportunity. I think it all depends on Kyrie, his health, what's up with KD and his Achilles. Because I think, you know, practice videos aren't game videos. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I think ultimately, I think Karis LeVert is in a good situation, having played a long time without those guys before they arrive, playing in the bubble with Kyrie and KD being out. Now you got to mesh that all together. It's going to be a joy to see. It's going to be a treat to see. And, I, and I'm excited. We've waited over a year for this to happen, and hopefully it all works out. Uh, Kyrie on Media Day released a statement as opposed to speaking directly to the media. Um, do Should we expect that the rest of the season? And is that a byproduct of, as you mentioned, the media overreacting to every statement or comment he makes? No, I think this was an isolated incident. Um, and I'm told you know, that, that, that's what that was. Um, when you're an NBA player, you're required to speak, uh, to, um, the media. Um, and you know, that was kind of, I think there's a disconnect between, you know, the day-to-day media members that cover the nets, um, and Kyrie. Um, 
I know that to be true um, firsthand uh, in December of last year uh, when I reported the shoulder injury that Kai had. And I was getting calls from people um, who basically said, like, they were complaining to the league office about Kyrie's not speaking to the media. You know, when you're hurt, you're required by NBA rules to speak to the media at least once a week. And this was around Christmas time because I was on your show, I think, the week before. And I remember, like, there was just this period where a lot of media members just don't, um, don't they want to do their job and they want to cover Kyrie. And I get a lot of calls just about different things relate, relating to that. And I think that ultimately um, every player is different in how they establish their relationship with, with their respective star player. The only thing I can, can honestly compare it to um, is uh, LeBron's first year um, in Los Angeles. And I was getting calls from, from LA writers uh, who was saying to me, like, you know, like, they feel like they're not that far removed from Kobe. And Kobe was the late, was a Laker, was the face of the Lakers. And, you know, Lonzo Ball is not Kobe. And no disrespect to him. That's just where he was in his career. But, you know, you know, Magic was a, was a great Laker. Shaq was a great Laker. And they all had some sort of rapport relationship with LeBron and, and, you, and, and a connection to the city. And I think one thing that I learned about that was, you know, because of the Los Angeles area's huge Mexican population, one of the reasons why a lot of people in that community connected with Kobe was because he was married to a Mexican woman in Vanessa Bryant. And so LA really took a liking to him because he was a man of the people, his wife was Mexican, um, and he liked people, he took time with people. And so with LeBron, they were looking for that sort of semblance in the same vein, and it took an adjustment because this was the first major, 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 like no disrespect to Miami at all, but Los Angeles is more comparable to New York than Miami is. And so there was this this disconnect with LeBron in year one, but in year two, they won a championship. And also every place that LeBron has been, he's always had his guys, certain guys that just were already there. You look at the Dave McMenamins respectfully, you look at the Brian Windhorses respectfully. LA is was different. McMenamin found his way to Los Angeles and you know, LeBron has this guys, but ultimately I, I think it comes down to comfortability. The other thing with specifically Kyrie is this, he has a distrust with media and that's dated back to his days with Cleveland. Um, and, and so Boston, it kind of was like, he didn't want to be there. He was traded there and there was a disconnect with the fans and, you know, he was hurt. And then, so now you come to a situation in Brooklyn, number one, you're playing for the hometown team or for the team that played in your home state when you were a kid. Number two, this is your media market, being a native of West Orange, New Jersey. And I just think that, you know, LeBron has, or excuse me, Michael Jordan had his Ahmad Rashad. Um, mm-hmm. LeBron has his Dave McMenamin. And, you know, I think Kyrie has to establish um, his level of comfortability with certain members of the media if he's interested, you know, and how to get that message out. You might have to reach out to Kyrie and let real, real talk be, be that for him. Nah, I was about to say, so Scoop, so you you basically saying you're the Ahmad Rashad to Kyrie. That's that's what's happening right now. That's what we see developing. Yeah. Is that what you think? <laughs> I mean, it's not a bad thing if that if that's what it is. Right. It, it's, 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 it's nothing negative about it. it you, you, may be, you may be that direct contact to him. And, and the person they trust the most. This is Teresa Weatherspoon, better known as Teaspoon, and you're watching Real Fans, Real Talk. Live from the camp. Come on, live. Bye, you Uh-huh. This is Real Fans, Real Talk. Talk. Real Fans, Real Talk. We as real as you thought. Real 